Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. It is Saturday, July 16th, 2022. You know what that means. The top stories that we talked about throughout the week, conveniently located in one location. Yes, you're welcome. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you Monday on Crime Talk. First, new surveillance footage has emerged in the bodega worker uh, Jose Alba case, trying to fend off the gangster he stabbed to death and his girlfriend as the pair attacked him in the store over, that's right, a $3 bag of chips. Now, Alba has been charged with second-degree murder for the incident that took place on July 1st. He used the store's box cutter to stab Austin Simon in the neck and chest after he charged into the store wearing his $350 Armani t-shirt, demanding that Alba apologize to his girlfriend, you know, for her EBT card not going through. Well, she had tried to buy, the girlfriend had tried to buy a bag of chips, but her card was declined as she uh, tried to pay for the uh, items. Now, Alba refused to let her have the chips, well, because she hasn't paid for him, which sent her running in a rage to call her boyfriend for backup. The girlfriend has uh, not been charged, despite video clearly showing her stabbing Mr. Alba in the arm. Now, after some uh, public outrage last week, Alba's bond was lowered from $250,000 to $50,000, and he was let go after posting the required 10% of that bond. Now, Simon, who was on parole for attacking a police officer when he died, you know, marched behind the uh, counter to confront Mr. Alba. And you can hear it on there saying, Papa, I don't want a problem, Papa, Alba told him calmly. Simon charged into the Blue Moon convenience store minutes after his girlfriend uh, tried to bag, tried to buy the bag of chips for her daughter, but the EBT benefits card was declined. Now the woman claimed Alba snatched the bag of chips from the child, is heard on the video asking Alba, did you put food? Alba responded that he'll try her card another time. Okay, mama, let me do it another time. My God, he says to her as she insists, there's money on there. He scans the card multiple times and hands it back to her, telling her it's not working. Now, edited footage cuts to show another customer in the bodega as the woman is heard yelling out of the view of camera. This is what she's saying. You can't touch my daughter. Don't snatch that out of my daughter, you effing piece of. The woman had reported that Alba snatched the bag of chips from her daughter's hands when they couldn't pay. She continues, I'm going to bring my N down here and he's going to F you up. My N is going to come down here right now and F you up. Nice lady. Nice lady. Real classy for sure, isn't she? Well, Alba tells her that it's not his fault and that the card was simply not working. What is he supposed to do? Another woman asked, did they take something from you? Alba replied, no, I took it back. Simon can then be seen on the video storming into the store and walking behind the counter where he confronts Alba. What's up with you, N-word? What is wrong with you, he yells at him. Alba was initially held at uh, Rikers Island on a $250,000 bail until that was uh, reduced and he had to pay the $5,000 in the kind of the wake of the security. Well, the soft on crime Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg has refused to answer questions regarding his office's charging decisions in regards to the Jose Alba case. I say self-defense, let Mr. Alba go, charge that classy dame um, for stabbing Mr. Alba. It's a $3 bag of chips and your benefits card doesn't work, your EBT, but yet your boyfriend's wearing a $350 shirt after he gets out on parole, why didn't you just pay with some cash? Why didn't you just use your own card? All this over a $3 bag of chips. I say charge the classy dame. Please go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up for a background subscription service. You'll be happy you did. If there's anyone out there you were ever curious about, what was in their background, now is the time to do it. If you're going to get involved with somebody, now is the time to do it. When you go to crimetalksearch.com, you put in the name, literally millions of public records are searched and a report is generated. And it's going to give you a report. If they have multiple social media accounts, you're going to find it. If they have multiple phone numbers, multiple email addresses, 
it's going to be found. And more importantly, you're going to get information regarding criminal history. Hopefully the person you're searching has none whatsoever. But if it's there, it's going to be found. You're going to get everything you'd want to know, whether you're going into business or whether you're going into a personal relationship, you're going to be able to find out the information you want to know. So go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up today. You'll be happy you did. Don't you just love a good love story? Do you remember that uh, Alabama inmate, Casey White? Well, guess what? He's been charged with the murder of his prison guard lover, Vicki White, after she helped him escape from prison and the pair went on the run for 11 days before ultimately being caught. Well, Casey and the prison guard staged a, a pretty well-planned escape from the Florence, Alabama jail for what correctional officer Casey falsely claimed was a mental health evaluation back on April 29th. The pair then swapped vehicles and used disguises as they made it across three states. Now, the pair were on the run for 11 days. Now, Vicki White was shot dead after a police chase in Evansville, Indiana. And police said that at the time she shot herself in the head. Casey was immediately arrested after the chase on May 9th. Well, the district attorney announced that Casey had been indicted for murder. It does not state that he shot Vicky in the head. The indictment shows that the six foot nine standing prisoner has been charged with first degree escape and in the course and furtherance of committing escape in the first degree caused the death of Vicky White, who died from a gunshot wound to the head, AKA that is known as felony murder. There are certain crimes which the legislatures have said are so dangerous that if you engage in them and somebody dies in that conduct, guess what? You get to spend the rest of your life in prison. So we'll follow this. Now, Mr. Casey already has big troubles before he met the prison guard, Casey, and um, he's probably never getting out of prison. He'll probably never, ever be uh, outside of a cell with no less than two to three officers surrounding him. But I don't think this was exactly how the love story was supposed to end. Well, just like life, things don't always turn out the way you, you hope them to. Hey, remember to subscribe if you have not already done so. Hit that like button and hit that bell for future notifications. You'll be happy you did. Now, I want to thank everyone who joined us last night for our Tuesday night live program. You know, the week before it was on Wednesday because I was traveling out of town, but we're back on our normal schedule. And let's give a big shout out to all of our Patreons who joined us on our Patreon show immediately following uh, our live show. I think we answered just about everyone's questions um, on the Patreon uh, show last night. So thank you all for being there. All right, next, the release of the unauthorized release of the Uvalde video. Well, the mayor is not too happy. Uvalde Mayor Don McLaughlin attacked the media after video leaked showing how police officers waited 77 minutes before finally engaging uh, the coward gunman Salvador Ramos um, before taking him down. The video also shows how easy it was for the uh, gunman Salvador Ramos, aka biggest coward in the world, to saunter into the school on the morning of May 24th and slaughter 19 children, including uh, two teachers as well. During the time that the police waited, Ramos slaughtered 19 children and two teachers at the Robb Elementary School. Now, Mayor McLaughlin uh, repeatedly referred to the release of the video as chicken and referred to the leak as unprofessional. Following his remarks, another member of the council chimes in and says, the mayor said that it was chicken. Well, I think it's chicken blank. You can fill it in. Well, Mayor, on behalf of Crime Talk, my position is that it should have been released already, not at the convenience of you all. People need to know the truth and they're entitled to the truth, even if it hurts somebody's feelings, even if, well, it makes people not look the best in the light under the circumstances. So it needs to be released. It should have been released sooner. The fact that it had to be leaked, I think goes to the fact that the government was withholding this information uh, and they were gonna do it on the government's schedule. So. Now, we talked about this last night on our live show. We here at Crime Talk have viewed the video and it makes you go, hmm, what are they waiting for? Referring to the police. Why did this coward not have any engagement walking into the school? There needs to be officers at the schools and they need to be armed. 
And just saying, if somebody saunters up to the school with a weapon, somebody, the police, should take that person out. Shoot first, ask questions later. Let's protect the kids. And, you know, if the person's there for legitimate reasons, they're going to put the gun down. If they're going to be there for not legitimate persons, uh, if they're going to be there for not legitimate reasons, they're probably going to shoot back and let the gunfight begin. But the reality of it is you can't let these people walk into these places. This is why these cowards go there. They know it is a soft target. They know it is a soft target, ladies and gentlemen. That's why they go there. They're cowards. They don't go to police stations. They don't go to gun shops where they know that everybody carries a gun. They're, they're cowards, so they go to places where they think they're not going to be able to do, uh, or they're going to be, they, they go to places where they think they can do whatever they want and they're not going to encounter any resistance. Well, every agency, every police agency that was in that hallway has to be held accountable for their actions or inactions. No one should be exempt. So we're not going to play the complete video. We'll put it up somewhere, either on our Patreon page or at scottreich.com because I think basically they'll take it down. But we can put up some uh, pictures from it or some, uh, some brief uh, video. But the video begins at about 11.28 a.m. from the point of view of a camera in the Robb Elementary School parking lot. It shows that coward, Salvador Ramos, violently swerving his car around a corner and crashing his car into a ditch in the distance, a plume of dusty smoke emerges from the crashing. You see two unknown men approach the car. Ramos responds by firing shots at them. The two men run for their lives across the road and toward Robb Elementary School. Two minutes later, a teacher is heard telling a 911 operator, I do not see him. I cannot see him. The camera switches to a camera pointed at Robb Elementary School. She says the kids are running. Oh, my God. Her voice breaks in desperation as she cries, oh, my God. Shortly after that, Ramos fires off random rounds at the school from the parking lot. The teacher instructs the students to get down, get in your rooms, get in your rooms. The camera switches again to footage captured by a witness who recorded Ramos calmly walking into the school carrying his rifle. Within the same minute, the camera switches to surveillance video from inside the hallways of the Robb Elementary School. And as he begins to disappear down a wide hallway, he drops his gun by his side to brush back his hair en route to classrooms 111 and 112, where the massacres unfold. Now, from the foreground, a young boy comes into the shot. He turns the corner, stands frozen for a second. Next, loud gunfire is heard. The boy can be seen running away with his arms flailing. Now, a message appears on the screen saying the gunman fires his rifle inside the classrooms for two and a half minutes. Three minutes later, the first police officers arrive on scene. Three cops, two uniformed and one plainclothes, charge toward the classroom before crouching in the hallway as four others calmly stay back. The four officers who stay back talk to each other. Their conversation is inaudible on the uh, recording. One uniformed officer who stayed back, uh, looking forward at his three colleagues, attempts to engage Ramos, checks his phone quickly, apparently to check the time. The officer is shown having wallpaper showing the Marvel Universe character, The Punisher. Now, I think the significance of that is during the BLM movement, uh, that was kind of a negative commentation for police officers. Well, then you hear three loud bangs that are then heard. After they hear gunfire, the two uniformed cops retreat slightly while the plain coast officer scurries all the way to safety behind a wall, checking his clothes to see if he had been hit uh, by a volley of rounds. Apparently, the officers are looking for floor plans um, and as minutes tick away, and more lives are taken. A full 19 minutes after the first officer's attempt to engage Ramos, the first heavily reinforced uh, officers arrive with uh, tactical gear and guns and ballistic shields, and see, you can see them there in the hallway. They remain a safe distance away from that coward Ramos. One officer leans the shield against uh, the wall, and a little over half an hour after the 911 call went in, more officers clad in combat gear, armed with long guns and ballistic shields, pile into the hallway. Once again, they do not attempt to engage Ramos. A picture-in-picture -picture appears in this uh, video, showing a small screen with an officer's body camera, illustrating the amount of officers with weapons drawn in the hallway, waiting. One officer can be seen busy scrolling on his phone 
in the body cam footage. The main pictures show officers in tactical gear forming a barricade or shield in preparation to attack Ramos. Ramos shoots off four more rounds 48 minutes after arriving at the school. There is little initial reaction from the assembled members of law enforcement and the phrase shots fires is repeated. There is more inaudible conversation as officers finally begin to march down the hallway towards Ramos. One leading the way appears to be wearing civilian clothing, including shorts and his bulletproof vest. He's armed with a rifle. The more heavily armored officers hide behind him. An officer in civilian clothing, bulletproof vest and helmet obtains hand sanitizers from a dispenser as he's waiting. After more than half an hour, other officers could be seen entering the building with ballistic shields and rifles pointed down the hallway towards the classroom where Ramos, the coward, is hiding out. Finally, officers breach the classroom and engage Ramos, quickly killing him a full 77 minutes after the massacre began. Now, like I said, we'll post the entire video either restricted for our Patreon members or at scottreich.com so that um, YouTube doesn't uh, take us down as pu putting up uh, sensitive videos. All right. Let's move on to the docket. That's just a tragedy. They should release that stuff. And still yet, other than the police chief resigning from his position as a city councilman, no one's been fired yet. No one's been fired yet. That's the funny thing about government. No one ever takes any responsibility. It's never anybody else's fault. Remember when, wasn't it Truman that said the buck stops here? Yeah, whoever's in charge needs to be resigned. They failed. When you're in charge, you're ultimately responsible for what your men, your women in your unit, the police department, do or fail to do. And you're ultimately responsible. Somebody needs to go. That's right. Mr. Alec Murdoch is already behind bars for separate charges related to embezzlement and fraud. And it's unclear when he will be arraigned for the murder of Maggie and Paul, who were shot dead on his family's estate on June 7th of 2021. Now you have to remember, that's Mr. Murdoch's now deceased wife and son. Well, he was indicted by the Colton County Grand Jury on two counts of murder and two counts of possession of a weapon during the commission of a violent crime after allegedly shooting Maggie with a rifle and Paul with a shotgun, according to the eight page indictment. Now a capital offense in the state of South Carolina that could see him face the death penalty if he's ultimately found guilty. Now, the property, which was actually in Maggie's name at the time of her death, was recently sold for $3.9 million, and those funds have already been earmarked basically for the numerous uh, creditors that have come calling. Now, the uh, property has now been stripped clean and abandoned. It's hard to believe that really it's uh, been over a year ago. On June 7th, the family hunting lodge was a grisly crime scene ground zero for what would turn out to be a labyrinth tale of betrayal, fraud, addiction, and murder with a failed suicide for hire plot and a suspicious death thrown in for uh, good measure. 13 months ago, Alec Murdoch told police he found the bodies of his youngest son and wife by the dog kennels when they returned to the family's 1700 acre hunting estate of Mosul around 10 p.m. Audio of the 911 call that he placed at approximately 10.07 p.m. that night, he can be heard telling the dispatcher in the high-pitched screech, I need the police and an ambulance immediately. My wife and child were just shot badly. Paul, 22, was shot twice with a shotgun, once in the head and once in the chest. Maggie had been shot multiple times with an assault rifle. Their uh, gunshot wounds were believed to be consistent with an execution style killing. Now, according to several sources, Paul's body was found partially inside one of the kennels while his mother's was several feet away. Leading investigators believe that she ran from her killer before being ultimately gunned down. At least two of her gunshot wounds were believed to have been inflicted while she was on the ground. Now, if the dogs barked that night, they did so in vain. According to Murdoch's lawyers, uh, 
Murdoch had an ironclad alibi, and his marriage with Maggie was nothing but full of love. But in the intervening months, a few different pictures has emerged, casting doubt on both claims with evidence and witness testimony likely that was heard by the grand jury. Now, Murdoch's alibi has apparently changed significantly since his initial claims that he was nowhere near the property between 9 and 9.30, the time the coroner gave the approximate time of death. Now, in the immediate aftermath of the crime, Murdoch told investigators that he was visiting his dying father and his mother, roughly 11 miles away at their home in Varnville at the time of the murders. Now, two weeks later, his brother, John Marvin and Randy Murdoch, told Good Morning America that he had dropped his father at the hospital in Savannah before visiting with his mother, who has dementia. According to an interview given by Murdoch's lawyer, Murdoch claims to have left the property around 9 p.m. to make the 20-minute drive to his mother's house and return to the Mosul uh, property as originally claimed around about 10 p.m. Now, it is an account that places him squarely on the scene within the time frame of the killings. It had been speculated that audio and video data gleaned from Paul's cell phone found by his body, but only recently unlocked by law enforcement is what prompted murder, Murdoch's dramatic change of tune. There have been reports that this audio and video data shows Murdoch speaking with Maggie, but that the high velocity impact spatter of blood found on his clothing that night places him at the scene of the murders when at least one of the victims was killed. Now, for the last 13 months, several theories emerged regarding the Murdoch murders. There was the ornery groundskeeper theory uh, at whom Paul Murdoch had allegedly screamed over the alleged seeding of a dove field, and that might have been what started it all. Perhaps revenge in regards to the death of Mallory Beach for the fatal boat crash in 2019. Maybe it was the 2015 death of a young gay man to which the family was uh, rumored to be connected. Now, the Murdoch family was to be running their own independent investigation, and they originally offered a $100,000 reward for information. But that um, reward money had an expiration date. That's something you don't always see. Well, the narrative changed when Murdoch was uh, arrested in a bizarre roadside shooting in September. Murdoch uh, was a drug addict, apparently they said, had been had been stealing from his law firm to support his habit, and the killings were potentially related to those thefts. Now, soon Alex Murdoch was facing 85 charges, the majority of which are related to the scheme to steal, steal millions of dollars uh, from his uh, clients, law firm, and friends. Uh, two of the charges are related to a, an alleged drug trafficking conspiracy. Murdoch, who said to have had this ironclad alibi on the night of killings, remained the only public named person of interest in his wife and son's death. But as time passed with no charges and no updates from law enforcement, a lot of people began to wonder whether investigators would solve the case at all. I certainly did. Speculation about the Murdoch family's connection uh, would maybe make some people think that this thing was just going to go away, die in the vine, so to speak. Well, the indictments handed down Thursday do not provide any detail about the what the investigators think happened that night when Maggie and Paul were actually killed. Uh, this means it's not clear who investigators believe was killed first. It also means that the motive has not been made public. A press release from SLED and the state attorney general's office did not explain why authorities took 13 months to charge Alex Murdoch, but the statement issued um, from Murdoch's attorney is demanding a trial in 60 days. That is where things are going to get good. If they only have 60 days from the date of arraignment to get to trial, well, we've seen how that has worked out uh, for other cases that we've talked about. Usually works out pretty well for the defense. A lot of moving pieces, but when you indict, you tell everybody, the court, the world, the defendant, that you are ready to go and you can prove your case within 60 days. So Murdoch attorneys have provided a statement through their uh, law firm denying Murdoch's culpability in Maggie and Paul's murders. And that states, quote, Alex wants his family, friends, and everyone to know that he did not have a thing to do with the murders of Maggie and Paul. He loved them more than anything in the world, end quote. I can hear the opening statement now. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, 
Mr. Murdoch has made some mistakes, but he is not the one that killed his lovely wife and young son. This is going to get interesting, ladies and gentlemen. I told you when the boating accident happened, something just didn't smell right. And here we go. Now, not to be too excited because of one man's tragedy, but it can be said that it's another man's opportunity. We get to figure out what happened and hopefully there will be justice for everyone involved. Next, a little update on Caitlin Armstrong. You know, the alleged murderer, yoga teacher, posed uh, as a woman by the name of Ari uh, to a man named Teal Ackerson that she met outside a tattoo shop while on the run. She told him that uh, she had not healed from a recent breakup when he tried to kiss her, and uh, she said that she wasn't ready. She failed to tell him that she was obviously suspected of shooting professional cyclist and Mariah Wilson after discovering Wilson was secretly dating her boyfriend. Now, Ackerson said he was stunned to see the old photos of Armstrong after she was arrested and allegedly underwent plastic surgery to change her appearance. He said that Armstrong had undergone a facelift and it had also been speculated that she had changed her nose to try and evade investigators. Now, Ackerson says he now realizes Armstrong's insistence on hanging out in secluded areas now suddenly makes sense. Police say that Armstrong shot Wilson after discovering that she was having an affair with uh, her cyclist boyfriend, Colin Strickland. Now, Wilson was discovered dead in an apartment on, in Austin, Texas on May 11th with two bullet holes in the head and one in the chest. Armstrong's black Jeep Grand Cherokee car was spotted driving past Wilson's friend's home where the uh, gravel bike champion uh, had been staying. Search warrants have revealed that Armstrong visited a gun range with her sister before the killing and was given $450,000 by Strickland. He also admitted to purchasing the two firearms between the end of 2021 and the start of 2022 for himself and Armstrong. Now, shell casings from the gun uh, labeled 9mm were found in the room where Wilson was shot just moments after returning from an outing with Strickland. Authorities have revealed that the yoga teacher paid for a nose job and dyed her hair brown after fleeing the United States using her sister's passport to fly from Newark, New Jersey to Costa Rica. This gentleman explained that he was aware of the case, but the change in her appearance meant he didn't pay any attention to it. He initially spoke to her outside of a tattoo shop and they ultimately exchanged numbers and they saved it um, in uh, their phones. He put in their Ari tattoo before the pair smoked cannabis and spent time together speaking up until their three days before she was arrested. He continued to say that Ari was a strange person. I met her outside the studio shop. Her friends were getting tattoos and she was waiting out there on the bench and we were having a beer at the lounge. It became apparent that she was trying to uh, have a conversation, trying to get to know me. So I began talking to her more and we ended up sharing numbers. We wanted to go out to different places. We went to with a bunch of different spots, but most of the time she wanted to be in a secluded spot, not around a lot of people. He says he didn't put any of it together. You wouldn't imagine it after it all happened. And I heard that she was really doing and running from it. it made sense why she didn't want to be seen. Just a little more information. He added that Armstrong had a bandage on her nose, which she claimed was from a surfing accident, and he didn't recognize the pictures uh, put out by police. Uh, Teal admitted he only realized that Ari was Armstrong after looking at her post-surgery images. After her arrest, Armstrong admitted that she had been going as Ari and was deported to Houston. She was taken into custody at the Travis County Jail and being held on a $3.5 million bond.